O fail open or FC fail close written right next to it. So the control system when it's working well, which is 99.99% of the time, doesn't make any difference whether it's fail open or fail close. But when that failure occurs, we want to make sure we have the right decision. So that control valve could either be fail open or fail close. We're going to make it a fail open because that's the safe situation. That's the safe position. Now these are just better drawings. Now we can see this is the, the valve body itself that comes in contact with the fluid. The fluid's coming in here and around that way out. There's the plug that comes down into the seat that blocks the flow. is a variable resistance to the flow. And this is the actuator up here. And, that, and there's a stem. And, and, and there's a little indicator. So you can send somebody out and they can read the, the, the position, which is basically telling you how much open that is. But it's a very small range, so you're not going to get an act. You're not going to be able to say, is the valve 53.75% open? You, you know whether it's probably between 55 and 60%, something like that. So we have we have fail open and fail close valves. These are little better uh, diagrams to, look, to understand the system. When you first think about it, it's probably easier to use these diagrams. Questions on that? So when the signal goes to the control valve, if the control valve is working well the, and the transmission is working well, we don't have to worry about it. But for every control system, we have to choose one or the other, so we're going to choose the one that's safest. Stable variables that are related to safety, high temperature, high pressure, those kinds of things, and they tend to move rapidly. We're going to choose our valve failure positions always, and then we're going to evaluate do we need to have an extra sensor automatically take over the control? That's unusual, but it can be done. It's usually for reactors or very high pressure systems. Okay, basic process control. Next is alarms. So, we know alarms. We have alarms. They wake us up in the morning, get us to class. Take four and four because it's so exciting. Now, nothing's automated with an alarm system. We have to remember that. Nothing is automated. There is a signal, a noise, an irritating noise, so that somebody will pay attention to it a blinking light, but after the person presses a button and says, I acknowledge that alarm, nothing else is going to happen unless the person takes an action. Okay. There will be a record of alarms, which is useful because when the operator says, that alarm never went off, I didn't know that tank was going to overflow. You can go back into the history and say, oh, wait a minute, what about this? The alarms are supposed to help us, including the sensors fail, but we need sensors for the alarms. So how do we do that? Let's just look at this a trend, this trajectory for a second. This is some made up hypothetical way a variable is, is behaving. And the red line is the alarm limit. So we have a maximum limit up here. And up here, we're showing the, the display and the enunciator. The noise. Like that. So in stage one, everything's fine. We're starting off, there's, there's no light blinking, there's no light showing, there's no noise. We come up over here, and we cross the alarm. What happens? We get the noise, the irritating noise. You should have one that says, Instead of an, uh, an alarm like eh, eh, say, do your four and four assignment, do your four and four assignment. 
<laughs> that would be irritating, wouldn't it? Okay, so something that will really be irritating. And the light blinks. So the light is blinking now. The blinking light means something's happened and the person hasn't acknowledged it yet. Because there may be several lights on at the same time, and when the noise occurs, we want to draw the person's attention to the, something that's new. So there may be 10 lights still on, but only one is blinking. That's the new one. Okay, so the operator comes over here, and after a while comes over and says, I'm going to acknowledge that. I'm going to acknowledge this alarm. Now what the operator should do is look at the variable, look at that part of the plant, say, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a special look at this plant. Now I'm going to push the button that says I acknowledge that. So that it stops annoying you know, her. So the noise goes away, and the alarm stops blinking. The light starts blinking, but it's on because we're still above above the limit. So the light stops blinking, but it's on. And as long as it stays above the limit, that light will stay on. Now, once we come below come back into the normal region, the alarm will go off, the light will go off, and now we're back in, in the normal operation again. Hopefully we stay there for a long time. Now, what about human nature? If you're an engineer and say, well, I want to, I don't know really what's important, so I'm going to put alarms everywhere. I'm going to just put a light, and they're going to be going off eh, 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 every time, every three seconds there's going to be an alarm. What's the person going to do who's operating the plant? Besides kill you, or you to come in. There's a button, right? That means that person's going to keep pushing, pushing the button. And what does that person learn how to do very quickly? Take the button, push it down, take a toothpick, jam it into the button, so that it's always down. And now you don't have to worry about the alarm. Now, when something important happens, the person isn't aware of it, and you have an accident. So we have to work, we have to make sure that we're thoughtful, that we only have alarms when they're important. Not just because the computer can generate thousands of alarms. Imagine if you're driving along and you have an alarm system. Oh, you're two inches too far to the left. Oh, you're going uh, two kilometers over the speed limit. You know, pretty soon you'd want to kill that computer. You'd find a way to turn it off. So the common design error is too many alarms. Okay. One plant that was studied had 17 alarms per hour. The operator only <coughs> acted on 8% of those alarms. Did anything after 8% of those alarms. That's, that's way too many alarms. Every couple minutes you don't have something really serious going on. Okay, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail with some of the stuff about priorities of alarms. Basically, try and only use the high priority alarms and let the rest of them just get printed out into the computers. Okay, where do we need alarms on our flash process? Where would we have alarms on our flash process? What are important variables? 30 seconds, turn to your friend, tell her or him, if the person next to you is the friend, let's have a chat. Okay, where's where's a, a really important variable that we need an alarm on? Pressure. Pressure's in a closed vessel, pressure is always important. Always important. So we're gonna put an alarm on pressure. We're going to put an alarm on high pressure only, not low pressure. 
Now, sometimes you may need low pressure because especially if there's a chance of getting a vacuum, what happens when you take a beer can and it's up and squish squishing like that? That's what can happen to a vessel. You've got lots of nice pictures of collapsed vessels. So if there's a chance of getting a vacuum, you may need a low pressure alarm. In most of our processes, we have high pressure, so we're going to have just a high pressure alarm. Okay, so we're going to have a high pressure alarm. What other variable would we probably have an alarm on? called a common failure mode, something that would fail in this design that would fail both the control and the alarm at the same time. What's the problem? sensor is not really measuring the pressure anymore. Because there's a pipe, we've drilled a hole into the pipe, and this, my pressure sensor's here, reading that. Now all of a sudden there's corrosion, so I can't read that pressure anymore. So P1 isn't functioning properly. What about my alarm in this design? The same thing is going to have a problem with the alarm. So this is not a good design. What I need to do is to come over here draw a circle, which is almost impossible. And put a P2. Uh oh can I do it? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put my alarm on a separate sensor. Because I, want, I don't want something that a failure here to also make, have the alarm fail. So I'm going to separate sensor and the same thing for the level. Now that costs money. And there's going to be a manager who comes in and says, why are you spending all that money? You've got one good sensor. Why can't you use it for two things? The reason is I want these hierarchies to be independent layers. I don't want one failure to influence or knock out one or two or three or four of the layers. So we're going to have an L1 here. We're going to need an L2 here, a separate sensor. Right. So the principle is independence of these different layers. Because we want very low probabilities of failure. Very, very low. Once every 10,000 years. Everybody see that? Control, not automatic control, manual. So when we, we talk 
talking about control here, sometimes we call it modulating. What is that? It means that I can move this a little bit. So there's modulating control. Right? I can move this a little bit. If I had a switch and just said it's either all the way down or all the way up, that would not be modulating control. So most of our process control systems were, were modulating, we're just putting a certain amount of heat in, a certain amount of steam in the heat exchanger, a certain amount of cooling water. Now up here, we're going to have basically on-off control, and we're going to take a very aggressive going to be automated, but when it, once it acts, it's going to cost us money. We're going to shut something down. We're going to divert product to a tank. We're going to send stuff to flare. It's going to cost us money. So this is very aggressive. And remember, we talked about deviations, small deviations, bigger deviations. Uh-oh, big deviations here. We've got to do something and fast. So we're all the way up to now. We can't, we don't think we can recover the process by any kind of standard control or manual operation. We've got to shut it, shut part of the plant down. Some, at least some of the equipment. So this is automated. It's a separate control system. So that we're going to stop part of the plant. So if, if we had one in an automobile, it would climb on the brakes immediately and cut the gas. We have to be able to handle the worst case situation. So if we if we need to have a flow out of our process, we need to have this whole system, the pipes and the valves, big enough to handle the, the biggest flow that can happen. We don't say, well, this probably isn't, isn't going to happen when you have the biggest flow, so we'll put it in the cheap, small pipes. No, that's not exactly. Right. So hopefully this is unusual. Hopefully this won't activate more than once every few years. Right? So we're very far away. Basic control alarms have not been adequate. So if we had a signal that was near the limit and it was kind of bouncing up and down, then what we might say is I don't I don't want to worry about the bouncing up and down unless it stays in the bad region for several seconds in a row. So we can have, a, we can program the computer. So it says, well, I'm, I, I, I want to shut the furnace down if the feed rate is low, but it has to be low for three seconds in a row, or five seconds in a row, and then I'll shut it. SIS, that's the standard international standard that's being used now. But engineers, we never believe the standards. We make up our own words. So quite often, maybe in the company you refer to call it ESS, emergency shutdown system. Again, we're going to rely on instrumentation, but it should capture instrumentation failures down at these lower levels. Extreme corrective actions required. <coughs> fully open, fully closed. You always, whenever this activates, you also have an alarm associated. Because if, if the computer has shut down part of the plant, <coughs> you want to immediately tell the people that we, we've done that. You want to have them try and figure it out by themselves. So you say, uh, SIS system 10 has activated. Okay, so how does this work? How does this work? So let's look at the boiler. So this is a, a really simplified version of the boiler. We have a, a drum of water here, and then we have a pipe that comes down here. And we have a flame over here. So this, this side of the pipe, this loop, can sees the flame and has very high uh, heat transfer, radiated heat transfer. Uh, to this 
side of the pipe. Now in reality, what does this look like? Think of your bedroom about three stories high. The drum is up on the top, and these pipes are on all of the walls. So there's lots of these pipes coming down. So there's a lot of these pipes, and there's a big flame that's about five feet long in your bedroom. Now you turn your bedroom into a bowl. So that's kind of the scope of it. Um, we put water in naturally, and steam comes out. Now, we want to make sure that we put the same amount of water in as steam is leaving. So we control the water level here by, by this level controller that brings in the water. And we want to regulate the steam pressure, so we control the steam pressure by adjusting the fuel. So why does the water go around this loop? Why does it go around the loop that way? Why does it circulate like that? There's no pump. On, on the right-hand side is much less than the left-hand side, so the water circulates around all. Now, if the water stops circulating for any short period of time, this is there's so much heat being released, released here that you'll melt these tubes. So it works fine. You know, don't worry about that. It's going to work. But if if there's not enough water, that's a very dangerous situation and will damage the so, we're going to have an SIS system that says if this level is less than its minimum, then immediately stop the fuel. Cut the fuel to zero. And that will be our one of our SIS systems. Now, just think for a second, how would you do that? This is the line. How would you do that physically? What do you measure and what do you adjust to achieve that? Take 30 seconds and talk about it. Sensor. We have a separate sensor. Quite often, 
we not only have a separate and independent sensor, but we have a sensor that uses a different physical principle. So we have redundancy, redundancy. We have more than one, and we have diversity, which means I'm using a different physical principle. Here I'm measuring the pressure difference in these two points. And the pressure difference between these two points would be that liquid head. Over here, I, I have a little side uh, chamber, and I'm measuring the force to hold up the weight. Right? So the weight, the weight is, is in the liquid. The amount of force that, that, uh, that's required to hold that weight up depends upon how deep it is in the liquid. So I'm using two different sensor principles, and of course I'm using two sensors, they're independent. Now I'm going to come over here, and let's, let's ignore this just for a second. I'm going to come over here, and I've got a, a shut off, a valve that will definitely have a shut off. It's a fail close valve. So if I ever cut the signal, that valve's going to close. It's going to shut down my boiler, but that's the safe thing to do. Now, how does this work? This is a pneumatic, remember that, that actuator? So normally, under normal conditions, I have to give a pressure to this actuator to make it open. So for five years in a row, it's going to be open, it's never going to do anything, and then bang, it's going to shut. That one time when the level goes lower than it should. So I need this signal up here that comes through and says, stay open. Otherwise, it would be fail close. When this logic says, uh-oh, we're in a serious situation, what I do is I come over here, and instead of sending this signal to the actuator, I send atmospheric to the actuator. So this is a three-way valve, and when it actuates, what happens is we get the connection this way. And this is just atmospheric, it's just open to the air. So that's atmospheric pressure, and that the valve will close. that these safety backup valves are working? It's hard. Okay, so there's, you have to test these things. There was, a, there was an accident in, in an SO plant in, in Australia, and it was a really bad one because they were processing all the gas for half of the, one of the provinces in Australia, and they had an accident when they shut their plant down. They had to close all the businesses in, in that city, and none of the people had heating for their home. Now, in Australia, it doesn't get that cold, but they still wanted to guess. And, and when they found is they had a safety shutdown system that was installed in 1972, and then I think it was 98 when they had the accident, it had, they had never done any maintenance. <laughs> so maintenance is really critical. Uh, you, you, you have different ways you can bypass. So for example, you can bypass this signal for a second and check the sensor. That you can move the sensor and make sure that this signal is correct, but you block it off here. Right? So up to the valve, 
you can you can do testing live, but these have to be tested when you shut the plant out. So remember, we're going to have a, a plant shut down every year, or every two years, for for doing maintenance. The, the trays are, uh, the trays maybe have some some corrosion on them, and you have to replace the trays. When you do all that stuff, you have to come over here and actually move this down. You can even go to the actuator and move the actuator, but you can't move the stem, right? Because you mentioned move the stem, you're stuck. So that's a good question. And, and in this system, you can do a lot of it, but you can't do the entire system unless the plant's shut down. But then, that's why it's managed when you have a shutdown. Because not only do you have to do all the minor changes to the process equipment, you have to do all of these kinds of maintenance that you can only do when the plant's shut down. So a company brings in a whole bunch of contractors, so there's you know, 10 or 15 times as many people as normal working on the plant at that period of time so that you can get all that work done. Because every day you're down, you're losing money. So these shutdowns are normally five days, seven days, every two years. The maintenance is critical. Okay, other questions? So this is another independent layer different sensor. It looks as though we're spending a lot of money. We are, but we need it. All right, that's a solenoid valve. Now, we can combine measurements in the logic for a shutdown system. So we could say if the level is below its minimum, or a particular temperature is above its maximum, or a whole bunch of other things, and then still have the same action coming out where we cut the fuel. So we can have logic. We can have logic in, uh, in, in an SIS system. Normally, we don't show that on a piping and instrumentation drawing. We'll just say this is SIS, whatever, some indicator, some number. And then that'll be in a separate piece of documentation. But we want to show all of the measurements that go into it. Because what happens if... Uh, if some instrument technician calls you up, you're the operator, and the instrument technician calls you up and says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calibrate L123. First of all, I say, don't do that. But if, if, if it's necessary to do it, then you have to turn the system off, which is a very dangerous situation, right? So, so if somebody does something with that instrument, says, I'm going I'm to do some calibration, <coughs> that would activate the system, and then we'd shut the plant down. So the operator has to be very aware of what measurements are used. The operator should know what's going on here, might not know the exact details of the logic. So the P&I drawing will show all of the sensors and all of the valves involved, but not necessarily all the logic. Uh, I'm not going to go over this in detail. There's, there's two kinds of failures that can occur in this SIS system. One is, you shut the plant down when you shouldn't have. That's costly. But worse, you didn't shut the plant down when you should have. That's dangerous. Okay, so, so we kind of want to bring both of those down. Um, most SIS systems are what's called a one-on-one. You have one sensor or one valve. The problem with that is, of course, if this sensor fails, you're in trouble, it'll, it'll shut the plant down when you should. For very high reliability systems where the cost of shutting down is a lot and the cost of making a mistake and having an accident is really high, you can have two out of three where you have three sensors, three sensors going into the logic and at least two out of the three must indicate that you should shut the plant down before you shut the plant down. So the probability of two sensors failing simultaneously is very low. So if one sensor fails, the plant keeps running, and then you have time to go and fix the sensor. Because there'll be an alarm that'll tell you something's wrong. If two go at the same time, then you shut the plant down. So this gives you very good performance, both in preventing uh, unnecessary shutdowns and having a very good reliability that's going to act when it needs to act. The problem with that is it's expensive 
and it's complicated. And the more complicated it is, the more chance there is of human error as well. So this is the most common or very dangerous systems we can have this kind of logic. Two out of three call it voting systems. There's some detail in the chapter about how you calculate these numbers, and I think they're slightly different. Any questions? You don't want a two out of two. Because then if one fails, the other's out. Which one's right? Having three and having a voting system where if you go with the majority, then that gives you good software bug in it. There's never any software bug, right? Never. Then we, we don't have any dependence. So in most companies, the soft the shutdown system is an entirely different number set of sensors, different set of wires, different computers, different interface screen to the operator. Everything is independent. That's not a legal requirement, but it is a legal requirement that you have to have very, very high reliability. So almost all companies have this kind of design. I only know one company that puts them together in the same computer. All right, so the shutdown system would have a separate screen for the operator, all the way out to the separate valves and separate So 
this is a safety pipe. So if this is the pipe, this is the exit pipe, this is our emergency exit pipe, I can hold it down and close it. And then the pressure starts building up. My arm is getting tired. At some point, the pressure is going to be so high that it pushes my hand in back. And then it opens, and it can release the material. Right? So the pressure which that releases is how strong my arm is. So that's what we have here. There's the spring. That's my arm. And here's my hand holding the little valve seat, uh, valve plug, sorry, that's holding down. That's closed off. Now, as the pressure builds up here, depending upon how tight that, that spring is, how, what the strength of the spring, the spring is, it's going to push that spring open and we release the material. Now, what happens when the pressure in A comes back down again? Closes again. Okay, so this is a self closing system. It can release material, and then after the pressure comes back below the maximum, it can reseat and you can continue running the plant. Here's a rupture disc. So that's called a safety valve. Here's a rupture disc. So this is simply, here's the pipe again. Here's our process A and B is out to release somewhere. This is just a, a metal diaphragm, a piece of metal. And it's weaker than the pipe, much weaker than the pipe. And it usually has some little scoring on it. And if the pressure gets too high, this diaphragm bursts. Okay. If it bursts open, we release the material. Then, when the pressure comes back low again, what happens? It stays open, right? We can't reclose close this piece of metal. So now we have to stop the plant and replace the diaphragm before we can operate the process again. Okay. So those are two, the two methods. Now notice, neither of these need electrical power. They don't need anything to lift this because it's the it's the actual force of the process that's moving. We don't have any external power. We don't have any external power that goes in there and sticks a pin in and says, okay, now time to break. It's going to burst because of the pressure of the process. So these are highly, highly reliable pieces. Yeah.